The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. And now, the man who takes the BS out of BS, Bill Spone. Welcome back to another episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. It's the goal of this podcast to help create better, more knowledgeable HVAC and building performance technicians. Part of the goal is to help the two professions better understand each other with the ultimate goal of making customers happy in the homes they live in and the buildings they work in. I've been working in the HVACR and building performance markets for almost 30 years. I've noticed a need for more scientifically rooted information and just more information sharing on how to do work correctly and finding out what's out there. Those are some of the reasons why I started the Building HVAC Science Podcast. In this episode, we'll be speaking with Blake Reed. Blake actually works from the state of Hawaii. He's going to share with us some of the challenges and rewards of doing home performance work in Hawaii, which has the most expensive energy, 12 climate zones, which I was amazed with, and no energy code, an aggressive state climate goal, and just for kicks, an active volcano. Blake shares with us some of his business techniques, which meld really well with his personal philosophies and encourages all contractors not to get stuck. So listen up as we learn something from Blake Reed of Terawatt Home. Welcome, or should I say aloha, Blake? You should say aloha. Aloha, it means a lot of things. And today it means good morning. Good morning. All right. You're an interesting guy. Oh, thank you. (laughs) One of the most interesting things I saw, we could kind of like hub off this point, but someone gave you a review on your website and the second sentence in is, I hate Blake. (laughs) That's right. That was Al. Blake is who I would be if I were smarter, better looking, and a hell of a lot more efficient. Aw. That turned from hate to praise. Yeah. What Al's doing now is like he quit his job with his family and now he's driving around the country in an RV with his three kids. And they're going to national parks and they're doing whatever they want. That's awesome. Yeah. Speaking of doing whatever they want, what the heck do you do? I do whatever I want. I help people with their houses. It's the same thing. I used to live in upstate New York, but people live everywhere. So you start to think, it's like, well, what other places have houses? And Hawaii has houses. And Hawaii has really expensive energy. And I thought I could be of more use here. So I live on the big island of Hawaii. And on this island, there are about 12 different climate zones. So I'm never bored. I used to live in a cold climate. And it was the same all the time. Winter would come, people would get cold. But here, I have a lot of different things to work on. So mold and indoor air quality. There's an active volcano. There's fog. It's volcanic pollution. There's high energy. There's cooling, there's heating. My town has a fireplace store, like a lot of people have wood stoves. So there's a lot to do. What uh, part of the state in upstate New York? I lived in the Finger Lakes. So like right in central New York, where the glaciers came down and just dragged through the landscape and they dug 600 foot deep lakes. And I lived like right on the slopes of those lakes, like near Ithaca. I actually grew up in Rome, New York, so I'm somewhat familiar with the area, and I had a cousin who had a boat on Cayuca Lake. Yeah, it's one of those classic, like, Greek-named cities, Rome, Ithaca, right? Yeah, <laughs> Syracuse. When did you move to Hawaii? You mentioned what spurred the move, but when did you get there? We got here about a year ago, so in the summer of 2017. My son had a really short summer because school here starts early, and school in New York kind of ends late, so his summer was really jammed up. But we got here in the summer, we got settled. We had found a house. When I'm working on other people's houses, I work on my house. And we just keep busy. What's the name of your business? How do you go about presenting yourself to the world? My business is called Terawatt. It's a pun. It's got two R's, T-E-R-R-A-W-A-T-T, Terawatt. And it's a play on a terawatt, which is a trillion watts. So like during my midlife crisis, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do with my life, it's like, it helps if I think we have goals. And so I set myself a lifetime goal of saving a trillion watt hours of energy. I think I'm up to about 50 billion so far. So there's a long way to go, but there's a lot of energy being used. So 
People don't necessarily call me about energy efficiency, though. They call me because they have other problems. My last one was like somebody's got mold because there's a lot of mold on this island. And somebody else called me because their bedroom wasn't getting cool and they already have nine tons of air conditioning and it still couldn't keep up. So people call me mostly because of health and comfort issues. And then just like a lot of us are figuring out in the industry, like the energy savings kind of come along for the ride, right? That's not how we sell ourselves. But it's always a perpetual problem, I think, that we have, which is that for decades, we haven't really done a good job as a home performance industry of like being able to present very clearly and articulately what it is that we do because we do so many things. So I'm still struggling with that. And if you have advice, that would be awesome. And if your listeners have advice, I would love to hear it. But generally, I think like when we tell people that we make houses more energy efficient and comfortable and healthier, it sounds like a little wishy-washy. It's not like solar panels or air conditioners. I'm still working on how to present. Yeah, comfort's a thing. Yeah. It's not something you can buy as an item. You can't go into Costco or even Walmart and buy comfort, can you? No, there's no aisle for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not in the grocery section. I don't know, comfort foods. That yeah, could be. <laughs> Meatloaf and mashed potatoes. But the problems here are the same. Like The vision I think that people have of Hawaii is not like necessarily true. Like because what you think of when you think of Hawaii is definitely real, but there's a lot of Hawaii. Like the island of Hawaii is about as big as I think Connecticut or Rhode Island, one of the small states. It's very large. It could take you a day to drive all the way around it. Are all the different climate zones on beyond the main lie island? And I guess I really don't know the geography. I'll just pretend I'm stupid. Actually, I don't have to pretend. <laughs> you know. I just am kind of stupid in this area. So tell us more about the physical makeup of Hawaii. Like, How do you get around if you have a client somewhere else in a different island? We fly. It's like in Alaska, like bush pilots. That's how you do it. So it's Ubers and flying, and there are a lot of commuter flights. Like Plenty of people live on one island and commute to another one. So you just go to the airport, you get on a plane, you get to work, and then at the end of the day, you fly back. And there's always that option. There are ferries, but those are slow. But a lot of people do just tend to stick to their own islands and go to the other ones like for vacation. But one of the reasons that we're here on the big island is that it's big enough that we won't get bored. We've got some enormous mountains, Mauna Kea is like basically right in the middle of the island. And Mauna Kea means white mountain because it gets snow on it. I went sledding last winter and it's funny snow. It's like a little crumbly. So it gets cold up there. There are desert, there's high desert, there's low desert, there's jungle, there are grasslands. There's like a lot of moisture on one side and it's really hot and dry on the other side. And the other islands are like small enough that their climates are a little more distinct. But even on Oahu, where Honolulu is, like it's got kind of a drier side and a wetter side. So it's really driven by the winds. Like the winds come from the east. Typically they bring the moisture, they pick up moisture, and then they kind of dump it on the east side of the island. And then before it, there's a line like right around the middle where it starts to like the rainfall tapers off because the winds have lost, they've dumped all of it. So then it gets hot and dry on the other side. But where I live in, on the big island, we're a little like, high up in the saddle. So like we're kind of on the line. So if we go one way, then it's kind of hot and humid. And if we go the other way, it's hot and dry. So if we ever get tired of being damp and chilly where we live, then in 20 minutes, we can be at a beach. And that makes it bearable. Going back to the concept of how do we communicate what people are trying to do in building performance and home performance, I think... What I'm trying to do is this podcast, and I'm trying to connect people and network them, people that I think have interesting stories to tell, but also network them outside of the podcast for sure to see what else they can do. Tell me about who you network with and why you network with them, because I know you have a pretty broad network. The first person that comes to mind is Nate Adams in Ohio. Nate and I are pretty good friends. And it's not fair for me to say that I knew him when, but there was a time when like Nate was was getting himself going and he was coming up with new ideas that are like really helpful, I think. And that's one of the things that I really like about Nate is that he's really like trying to make nice things happen. Instagram has been really fun for me because I follow a bunch of people. There's a guy I follow, his name's Nick. He lives in DC. He's just an enthusiast, building science enthusiast. 
There's Christine Cronin, like she's an architect. She does great Instagram little stories. Like she re- works really hard on like taking pictures of buildings and then writing like what she sees are wrong with them or like things that are people are doing right. There's some few groups on Facebook, Spray Foam Worldwide, and then there's people who follow along with the Home Performance 2.0. There's a fun group, Energy Star Homes, The Horrors which is about like things that can go wrong even when people try to do the right thing, which is make good houses. My website was built by Energy Circle, and they're really handy uh, like to know as marketers and like people who are like trying to really drive the industry forward and like by helping people tell their stories. What you would do with True Tech Tools and your podcast is really great because it keeps the focus a little bit on the like the equipment that we use because a lot of us show up with like magic trucks full of all sorts of stuff (laughs) and thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And it's always nice to be able to look and see what kinds of things other people are using that might be applicable to what I'm doing. And then there's another Facebook group, the HVAC School Podcast, which is basically people who are a little more concerned about heating and air conditioning. It's really fun to follow. I do a lot of passive following of people. Because it's, I like to learn when people who are smart speak, it's nice to be able to just let them do that and just not interrupt them so much. And Facebook is a really great way, I think, for me to learn because I can just follow along and I get bits of information every day. So it's a way to feel like I'm still learning and just keep it going because otherwise I think we start to dry up a bit and then we get bored maybe. So it's no fun being bored. If you're not liking what you're doing, then why are you doing it? Right. Go do something else that's funner. Fun fact, I was driving yesterday, driving back from a training event and a long drive, and I tuned into the local NPR radio, and I'm listening to Marketplace, and then they interviewed Nate Adams. Yeah. <laughs> for like 15 seconds. <laughs> so he said he has, still has 14 minutes and 45 seconds left of his 15 minutes of fame, so he's only cashed in a part of it. <laughs> But this is great because it seems like the home performance industry, it's always on the cusp, right? It seems like it's never like really broken through and really become mainstream. And I worked under a state program for a really long time in New York. And the goal of state programs, energy efficiency programs, was always to try to like transform the market or give it a boost and like get people like encouraged about energy efficiency. But like the rules kind of creep in and then it gets really hard and then it starts to become about the energy because it's an energy efficiency program, but nobody's really excited about energy efficiency. So the more people like us who can just get out and just tell stories about the other things that we do, and maybe if we take the focus off the energy, then we can start to have some real effect. Because We've seen really bad weather happen lately, and the weather is like comes from the climate. So some people will tell you that we've already passed the tipping point for our climate, and it can become dispiriting. Like, what are we doing, right? What can we do to like turn the ship around? Because countries are backing off from their climate goals, and they're not being able to meet them, and new people are elected. So Australia and Canada and the US and Germany and Japan and big countries that were supposed to help to push climate legislation forwards are just backing away. And now it's like becoming a lot less likely that it's going to happen. It feels like it's more up to the individual to start to do something because we can't trust our governments to be able to do it for us. No. And I think it's more significant if the individual does it. I was at a conference called Habitat X a couple months ago. And One of the people there, Chandler Von Schroeder, an ex-government employee who has opinions about how things run with the government, and he can now share them. (laughs) Those people could be dangerous. Yeah, we should hear more from them. Yeah, they can be (laughs) dangerous and fun. (laughs) Right. Got to get them on the podcast. I took one of his lines and I sort of adapted it or adopted it and adapted it in that I say, I'm going to try to sneeze twice a week. By that, I mean, I want to spread the germ of this idea about home performance to two different groups of people every week, consumers and practitioners. Yeah. 
So however I can do that, but if I set a goal to do that two times a week and other people join me in that goal and do this on a person-to-person basis, and again, we talk about the person-to-person impact that can have and recognizing and realizing things, it's grassroots. I guess it's just a grassroots effort that I think is going to be effective. And you can think of it in a sales way too, because you're trying to sell ideas. And if you sneeze on two people every week and you keep doing that, then if your sneeze ratio is like 40%, like then- out of every 10 people you sneeze on, four of them will be infected, right? And 40% is a good ratio. That's a really good close ratio for jobs. But it helps if it's targeted, right? You can't just go sneeze on everybody. You need to go like find people who maybe have a little less immunity to what you've got. And that's those are people who are ready to hear what you have to say. They're out there, but they're not necessarily active and you don't know who they are. And that's, I think, part of the issue is that one of the only ways we know who's ready to hear what we have to say is like, is when they get in touch with us. So like the more that we can get out there and just say, yes, then like, you know, we're ready to help you out. If you're ready, then let us do that. And we can figure something out together. And that's one of the ways that I really like to work is like working with somebody to solve their problem. But then I'll sneak in my stuff, like just along with it. Like I'm going to go, there's a house that needs a dehumidifier and I helped them figure out a dehumidifier plan. But along with that, like I do air sealing, like I'm going to crawl under their house and I'm going to air seal there. We have a lot of vented crawls here, like, but they're really vented. Houses are on basically on stilts. So air seal the top and the bottom of the building so that the dehumidifier can work better. And then we'll get some energy efficiency out of that too. But that was not a choice that I gave them. I didn't ask them if that was something that they wanted me to do. I just told them that that was part of the package and it was included. So it's really up to like the smart people to get out there who are installing equipment to do things that like kind of feel like they're coming along for the ride, but are going to help make their equipment work better. Like one exciting thing that I'm seeing is I'm seeing people like Neil Comparetto and Stephen Rarden on there are a couple of Facebookers that I'm familiar with who they're heating and air conditioning guys, but they're starting to do a whole performance too. So that is really nice to see is that there are people who are getting it, who see that the equipment cannot solve the problem all on its own. We have to do more things. And I think right there, you could even, if you had to, build a case that you're doing a better job when you install the dehumidifier if you do the air sealing because you're presenting less of a load. That sort of makes sense. I think you could pitch that once you had to, but don't be afraid to do the right thing. Just do it. Yeah, just do the right thing. Like now there's a difference between like little things. In this case, it's a house that's not very big and it won't take me very long to air seal the attic plane and also the crawl under the house. I mean, there's plenty of access. I can, it's got to pull down stairs. I can walk into the attic. I can walk around in it. I can roll around under the house. I can't exactly sit up, but it's not so bad. And then when I come out, like I'm sitting on a hillside and I'm staring at the Pacific Ocean and there's a nice breeze. So this is different from other houses in different other parts of the country where go in a crawl space, like it's gross. And I've done plenty of that. Right? And you're in there all day and there's mouse droppings and it's dusty and spider there are bugs and snakes and it's in all sorts of stuff that you don't want to breathe and you have to wear a mask. And that kind of situation costs more. And somebody has to pay for that unless you're donating your time, which I don't think we should do. Our time is too valuable to be giving it away to people who are not like charities if they don't need it. It's hard to figure out and it takes a while. It took me some years to learn when to like give things away and when to charge. And also there's a perpetual how much do you charge conversation because if you charge too much, then people don't buy it. And if you charge too little, then you don't make enough money and then you go out of business and then you can't help anybody. So there's somewhere in there, there's a sweet spot and you're always like the pricing pressure is always downwards. You want to do a good job for people. You want to feel like you're pricing it fairly. But when I see that people are looking for a contractor and they're asking their friends for recommendations and they want somebody who will do it at a reasonable price, I get a twinge because reasonable means something different to everybody. Really what they say when they say reasonable price is they want cheap. But good work doesn't come cheap. And we all know that. So the more we stick to our guns and do good work at prices that make sense for us and our clients then we'll be okay. Because houses are such complex systems, it's really hard just to give a price based on a phone call. Yeah. 
it's just kind of crazy to think about that because you don't know the situation that you're going into, especially in uh, existing construction. Right. They also, like people ask for the free estimate. And they say, well, I don't do estimates. Like I'll give you a price. It's not an estimate. And that takes time. We're going to figure out a price in your project and then we're either going to do it or we won't. But it takes time to put this number together. But you can't spend all of your time driving around giving away free estimates. That's not a process that works very well for me because I don't have that much time to give. I'd rather be helping people who pay me than meeting people who won't. But every market is different. So sometimes we just have to get used to it, that this is what people expect. And it's up to us to teach our future clients that there are other ways of doing things. You've run into some interesting things, I, I know, in Hawaii. Yeah, we had a volcano. Yeah. <laughs> volcano was act- <laughs> That's more than interesting. That's scary. That's it's on uh, the news every day. It's, yeah, I got a lot of notes. It's like, are you okay? I say, well, it's a big island and the volcano is on the other side of the island. And as volcanoes go, I don't want to minimize it. Hundreds of houses were destroyed by lava. And they were just eaten. And that was before we had a hurricane. Right, right. That was just a few days ago. Yeah, and like Hawaii is a small target. So like it doesn't really get hit by hurricanes very often, but when it does, it gets hit pretty hard. But one thing that happens is we have such large mountains, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, and there are five mountains on this island. They kind of just push the hurricanes away. So they always kind of seem to go south, but every so often they come and they hover and like we get a lot of rain. But the volcano was a big deal because now the national park is needs to be a bit rebuilt. And we lost a lot of tourism, which is important for our economy. And it was uh, spewing nasty stuff into the air, which the winds were carrying around to one side of the island. So people are familiar with smog. And what we had is called VOG, which is volcanic pollution. A lot of sulfur dioxide, a lot of particles, a lot of people having health issues. I know people who had to move, like just get off the island and move away because they couldn't handle it. Because a lot of our houses here, like they're simply built and their like air sealing is just now making its way into the energy code here. So everything was getting in and normally people are used to it, but the volcano doesn't erupt very often and it erupted pretty continuously for a while, but it was sedate, like earthquakes every day, but only a couple five point somethings. As eruptions go, it could have been a lot worse. It just kind of poured out. But then it stopped. It's like down to a trickle now. So we don't know if it's going to pick up again. We just don't know. So yeah, you say interesting things. That was interesting. There was a lot going on for a while. How do you find customers or how do customers find you? Honestly, like the best way that I've found, and I've been working with Energy Circle for a really long time, and their advice has always been so spot on, which is like work on your website, like be authentic. And then try to keep your content fresh. So I blog. If you go to my website, which is Terawatt Home, then every so often if something interesting happens, I write about it. And I try to write like in a Hawaii specific way. So like when the eruption was happening and there was volcanic gas, like I wrote about air cleaners. Then somebody called me because that house that the bedroom would never get cool. It's like I went and I looked and I saw holes in the attic air sealing problems and really high air leakage. So I wrote about that. But what happens then is that these things live on my website. People who are like, they Google something and I come up a bit because there aren't a lot of insulation contractors here. And I write about dehumidifiers and like things that are important to people. So when they Google it, I come up and then they read about it. And because I try to write the way that I like to read, then they're typically pretty short with some good pictures of like actual things that I've seen. And then people get to learn a little bit about like what it might be to work with me. They get a sense of what kind of mojo I'm going to bring to their house. And then they choose to call me or not call me or they call around. But then when I blog, I put it out to just local Facebook groups, the local marketplace groups, like just the ones that are pretty specific to where I live. I started off on Instagram with a post and then it automatically goes over to my Terawatt Facebook. And then I share it from my Facebook to like all these groups and you just keep putting the word out. People find me that way. But then like you mentioned Al's like uh, review, it's like the reviews that I get, that was on my website, but I also actively solicit Google reviews 
And those live on my Google presence like forever. So that's word of mouth that's just good for a long time. And the thing that was really surprising to me was that when you ask clients for whom you've done good work who are happy to review you, if they're the kind of clients that you have a good experience with, they won't write one or two sentences. Like They'll write paragraphs about what it was like to work with me. And I'm not asking them to do that. Like I'm just asking them to click the five stars and maybe say a little something, but they go so much further and that's really gratifying. So people see that too. I kind of create this online presence, but then I go out, I meet people too. And you just try not to be pushy and you just listen to people and how their houses are. A lot of people have solar and everybody loves to tell me how much solar they have, which is awesome because we need it. But it's like people are always feeling maybe a little slightly defensive when they hear about what I do because they're maybe concerned that I'm going to start addressing problems in their house like with them that they don't really want to deal with. Like They're fine. It's not to the point where they need to call me in yet, but they know what I do. And then maybe they'll tell somebody the next time they like one of their friends says that their air conditioning can't keep up. Maybe they'll say, I know a guy. So we do that. A lot of word of mouth. Tell me about the blog post on NYSERDA. Oh, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> it's very impassioned. Oh, yeah. You're very articulate, both written and verbally. Oh, thank you. You seem like a very smart guy. You don't seem like an unreasonable guy. In sort of just a couple, three minutes, what got you going here? And I would direct other people to read that too. And I'm not afraid to hit that issue head on because- you're a reasonable kind of guy I'd like to work with, and I want to hear what you thought about what NYSERDA was doing to the market in New York State. I was in the home performance industry, and NYSERDA has a system set up. What they do is that they incentivize energy audits for homeowners by making them essentially free. So anybody can have a free energy audit. It is free to them, free to the homeowner. But what a homeowner doesn't see is that the contractor actually gets paid like behind the scenes. So... I would go and I would do an energy audit and then the money would come in kind of a back way and it was $250 for a typical house. So what NYSERDA has done is started to systematically devalue like what it is that we do because it's really challenging to get to a house and assess it in a short period of time and then come up with a list of recommendations and then like get that to a homeowner and do that within this $250 time frame. Budget, yeah. Yeah. But then what that does too is that like when NYSERDA, like when a program creates like this free product, then it's like that becomes the thing. Like now it is really hard for anybody to sell like a more comprehensive thing because like why would somebody buy it from you? if they could get it for free. Because in their minds, it's all going to be the same. Then instead of stimulating the market, what NYSERDA has done in is has created the market. Like that is the market. So now they're driving the market. And now they're telling you what you can and cannot do. And they're adding their rules. The rules never get taken away. Rules keep getting added. Sometimes they just get changed around a little bit. But then you have to do all these things. So the $250 is like that would pay for an energy audit would also have to pay for like all of this back end labor. And then what happens is the system starts to become inefficient because now you need people to manage the paperwork that NYSERDA is recommending. So now what you're doing is like you're starting to increase the cost of things. And the money has to come from somewhere. And it's not coming from NYSERDA. You start to have to raise your prices and the prices get higher and higher. And then it becomes harder for people to justify paying those higher prices, especially when their energy bills aren't that high because energy is still relatively cheap. There's a lot of natural gas and electricity and I can go on and on. But if anybody read the blog, I got a lot of comments on that one from people who are like, yes. But the thing that really got me was like, they kept asking me like, why does stuff cost so much? Why are you charging so much for attic insulation or air sealing? It's like other people charge less. And I'm like, well, I'm not other people. And you can't really tell me how much to charge. It's none of your business, really. You're telling me that I'm not worth it, or you're saying that I can't make enough. Are you telling me that you're not going to support my pricing for whatever reason? And my son isn't going to be able to go to college. I need health insurance. There's impact. 
yeah, it's I have a family to feed. My wife works. I work. My son works harder than anybody. He's in middle school now. It starts to become when you're part of the system in when you're inside it, it's harder to work outside of it. But when you're inside of it, then you're inside a lot of boxes and you have to stay in the boxes. Right. And that doesn't really work for me. So I left. And now I live here with the electricity that costs three times as much as it did before. And it's <laughs> so, what is the, the rate uh, per kilowatt hour there? It's like more than 30 cents. Sometimes it's up to 34. Yeah. And the utilities here do the same. Like they do in a lot of places, they kind of just move the rates around and there are a lot of shenanigans with solar and they're worried about grid stability and it's same issues. But they're real ones because it's not like if our grid goes down, we can just borrow some power from Idaho. No, you can't plug into anything. There's no extension cords that long. Nope. And I read today that sharks are chewing on the Wi-Fi cables or the internet cables oh, <laughs> in the ocean. Well, maybe that's why we couldn't get connected earlier. Maybe there was a little shark bite there. Anything could happen. I'm just amazed it works at all. Like I'm in the middle of the Pacific and I'm talking to you magically through the air. This is something that we should celebrate. It is amazing, but electricity costs a lot. And for some people, like solar panels are literally a no-brainer, but it's just like what I saw in other places too. It's like solar is not the solution. Because if you're swapping out your utility bill for a lease and it's kind of an even trade, then I could see why you would do that. But sometimes it costs more. Like there are all these things, right? Like how much is the PV array really worth? So that makes it really exciting when like companies like Pearl Certification show up and start to value all these efficient things in people's houses. So I'm excited about that. I am too. I'm very excited. In fact, going back a little bit, we were mentioning people you network with. One of them was, I believe you could pronounce his name, Terje Gronas. Terje. He did the Terje Energy Star Homes, the horrors. Yeah. He actually is getting his home that he's selling listed with Pearl Certification yeah. because he wants to have all those attributes he finally arrived at with his home to have them valued when he goes to sell it. So it's very interesting in that, I feel a little bit of spark of pride because he said that he didn't know about it until he listened to the podcast. Yeah, right. And he's the first home in Georgia that's doing it. And it's like, wow, actually, maybe I am making a little difference too, just like you are here. Right. You sneezed on him. And I now did. he has a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's got the virus. He's got the bug. Right. And people are smarter now because of you. You did that. So thank you. We just keep saying this, not exactly like a broken record. It's like there are a lot of different stories to tell. It's gratifying that you think mine is interesting. My house is like completely unfinished and it's a work in progress. And if Pearl came and looked at my house, it would not score anything. It would be horrible. I don't think I have any of the things that Pearl lists as quality attributes in my house, but it's mine and I don't have a heating system. That's not true. I have an electric blanket. My wife does. It's a personal heater, right? <laughs> and our heating bill is about $100 a year. That's how much it costs to heat ourselves. Like I had thought that I needed a mini split and now I don't think I do. Like I definitely don't need air conditioning because I'm wearing wool socks. And I think mostly what I need is just a good dehumidifier. The longer you live in a place, the more you get to know about it. And it would be cool if like Pearl came out to Hawaii. I wonder what kind of fun we could have. Oh, yeah. That might be fun. They're very open-minded people. You should make the contact. I encourage you to make that connection, see where that can go. Yeah. Yeah. We covered a lot of ground here in our conversation today. Any kind of closing thoughts you want to wrap up with? Anything you want to leave the listeners with? If they got this far, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Where's the Easter egg? Come on. <laughs> so we should make this a good one. If you're feeling stuck somehow, if you're feeling like you need to be doing something, I think that it's a big world and you could do anything you want, really. You can live anywhere. My wife and I were Peace Corps volunteers in Africa. So you get really used to just living abroad for a couple of years. And if you do that, then moving to one of the United States is really not that big a deal. There's a lot you can do. And if you're feeling limited, then start looking for other things you can do if you want to. But if you don't, that's cool. Just try to be happier. Like one of the things that happened when we moved here was we felt like almost immediately a lot of tension just drained from us. There's a lot of mainland tension and a lot of it I think is driven by the news. So there's a lot of news and a lot of it's bad because they don't really show good news on TV a whole lot. So you start to get sadder and sadder. And if you can disconnect from that, then you'll start feeling better. And it happened when my mother-in-law came to visit this summer. She was here for two weeks and after one week, she was an entirely different person. 
like she changed in one week just by being here. And that was in a house that it took me eight months to just evict the rats from this house. <laughs> so we talk about air sealing. It's like, for me, it was more about big things, right? And they were in the walls and they were chewing, but it didn't matter. Like I had a project and the project was get rid of the rats. But that gives you a sense of like what my house is like, which is like not very comfortable by I think like typical standards, but you can do it. I cooked on a, an electric hot plate for a long time. And then we upgraded to a two burner induction cooktop. We don't have an oven. I kind of miss it, but we grill outside, but it rains a lot. So it's rusty. So now I need to fix it, but there's always something to do. If somebody's looking for a nugget, it's that you can do what you want within, and we get that it's hard. Like it wasn't easy to move here, but it was worth it. It's your own perspective, your own value you have on things and yeah. don't feel stuck. Don't feel stuck. It's easy to feel stuck. It's comfortable. Like being stuck is a comfortable place to be because you can start to just accept that. And then that becomes what you are. You're a stuck person, but you don't have to be if you don't want to. Cool. Thanks for coming on, Blake. And I encourage everyone to go to his website or at least look at the blog. There's a lot of posts on there. Uh, it's a great thing with a very personal perspective that you get a chance to see kind of inside his head, inside his world. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for doing what you do, because how long does it live for? Does it live forever? Yeah, it's pretty much evergreen until the internet comes down. <laughs> well, the sharks are going to chew on the lines, and then... Well, that just affects you, man. <laughs> it's, the other 49 states will be just fine, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. So, it's all right. And come visit. We suffered a bit with the volcano, and tourism dropped off, and everybody started offering deals. And it's when you come here, uh, you rack up a lot of frequent flyer miles. There you go. <laughs> We're all working the system out here. I will take you up with the, on that. And I think it'll be within the next year. I will see you, meet you in person. That'll be awesome. Thanks a lot today, Blake. We appreciate you coming on the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Everyone, listen up for next time. But this time, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Blake. Aloha. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast with Blake Reed. Hope you enjoyed some of the things he had to say there and even perhaps were motivated by what he had to say. I want to share with you a little quote, a motivational quote that I found which sort of relates to what Blake's talking about. It's by Carol Burnett. Only I can change my life. No one can do it for me. So hopefully that motivates you a little bit to change your life if you're interested in doing so. If you're in the market for some of the tools or test instruments that Blake mentioned or others mentioned in this podcast, I own True Tech Tools, www.truetechtools.com. We carry a lot of the products that you can use for HVAC and building performance diagnostics. We have a discount code of HVACBS if you'd like a discount. Even if you're a consumer out there, we do have some consumer products for indoor air quality for monitoring carbon monoxide, particulates, other things that are in the home. You might want to check that out too. Well, thank you for listening and following us on Building HVAC Science. If you haven't subscribed, we encourage you to do so. You can also follow us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, Building HVAC Science. And we post there occasionally different things we find interesting and I find interesting in the world of Building HVAC Science. Thank you for listening and we welcome you back to a future episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Take care. Take care.